today in the art of making. Painting technique and conventional way of clothes decoration. How and from what silk threads are made of. Chandeliers in the shape of Shanarak, modern, beautiful and original. As Coco Chanel said, handmade work is a luxury, not everyone can afford it. If you're not willing to pay for it, make it yourself. Just take the brush and start painting, even if you do not know how to do it. At least you will get a good therapeutic effect and positive emotions, says Aysanum Kastieva. And today, especially for our program, Aysanum will give a masterclass on textile painting. Also, she will tell us from where she gets inspiration to create fashion items. Now we will work on a sketch of the jacket. We'll also pick up an ornament. We may choose it from the book or on the internet. Well, or otherwise, I'll call my grandma. My grandmother, Lisa Kalimova, creates ornaments herself. She invents them. Sometimes I call her and say, Grandmother, I need an ornament. She says, five minutes and she sends me different options. My relatives are artists and creative people, both from my mother's and father's side. Abulhan Kastiev was the first artist of Kazakhstan, and he was my great-grandfather, from my father's side. My father is an interior designer. From my mother's side, my grandfather, Muhit Kalimov, was an honored art worker of Kazakhstan. My grandmother, Liza Kalimova, also worked as an art restorer for 14 years at the Kastiev Museum. My mother, Daria Kalimova, also works as a tapestry designer. In other words, this is my creative family. This is why I've been walking the same path since my childhood. Theater and cinema costume designer. This is a profession of Isanim after graduation from the university. Choosing this profession has led me to what I like to do, and I'm good at it. And to be honest, this work inspires me. I can't say with certainty that I want to do it always, but I know for sure that I can get away from art. I took my profession of costume artist literally. I started painting on fabric. I was kind of an artist, but I painted on costume. That is, at the moment, clothes are my canvas. I work with cotton with mostly dense texture because it holds the paint better than the other fabrics. First I process it, then I wash it and iron it. Most often I work without a sketch, it depends on my fantasy. This cozy apartment in the center of the capital is more like a design laboratory, where a truly creative atmosphere reigns. This is where Isenem experiments. One day she came up with an idea of making something even more unique. At our faculty of costume artists, every year the mentor holds a special show for us. He gives us a topic. At first, the second year of study, I had a free topic. I created images for a singer, Ariana Grande. The third year, the mentor gave us a topic of national style, and everyone understood it in their own way. When I came to the market for fabrics in search of a national style with some kind of a highlight, I found that there were no fabrics that would express what I wanted to show. And right at that moment, my husband said, why would not take a clean cloth like a canvas? You can draw whatever you want in it. 
I came home, unfolded the fabric as a canvas and started creating what I really wanted. The colors that I saw in my head, that's how my collection was created. Tenderness is the first definition that comes to mind when you look at the collection of Aysenem Kasteva. The palette has an incredible depth. Pearl is mixed up with light purple, coral, dusty pink shades. There are no clean lines. Concept of blurriness prevails. I begin with preparing the paints I have to work with. Since I work more with pastel shades, the most important thing for me is having white paint. Acrylic inks on textile. Sometimes I use a fabric diluent. Palette is ready. Here I have our future jacket sleeve and I've already hand-drawn the ornament. After determining the color, we apply it to the fabric. People like the shades I work with. They like tender, pastel shades. I rarely meet national clothes in such colors. I don't know why, but I've loved pink since I was a child. Even from my collection, you can understand that I stick more to the shades. I don't like bright colors very much. But you can do that. The artist must love all shades. We finished the sleeve of our jacket. Let's get to its bottom. There will be a new technique on this bottom, more like watercolor. These slightly drawn patterns. I will pull them on this violet background in white and beige colors. I hope we'll manage to do that. I'm doing this technique for the first time right now, so I'll think which one is better. I send him tries to make barely visible contours by mixing paints and forming her own painting style. I can't say that I paint perfectly. I have very curved lines. That's why I'm always criticized by my husband. He's an architect himself and loves clean, flat lines. I say, but this is my artistic view. I see such an ornament. And he says to me, no, you find excuses for yourself. You drew a crooked ornament and you say you're an artist. You call stain an artistic stroke. So I cannot give an advice on how to make an ornament perfectly right, as I can draw it myself. To be honest, I don't understand creative people who divide brushes according to their quality, and so on. I'm not good at it, so I can't give any advice. When I buy it myself, I can sense how it feels for me. Of course, I buy tougher brushes to work with fabric. After I finish painting the item, I give it a day to rest, even maybe more than one day, to ensure that the paint is firmly held on the fabric and is not afraid of washing it's enough to simply iron it. After that, you wash it. You wash it in the washing machine at 30 degrees or by hand. In Aysenim's work, we can see her love and attention to the cultural heritage of Kazakh people, which has been passed down from generation to generation for centuries. Since recently, I have been asking my four-year-old son to help me. I say, do you want to earn 500 tenge for a toy car? 
Then take a brush, paint, sit down and help, because mommy doesn't have time. And he sits down with his brush, dips it into the paint. Surprisingly, he has never spoiled anything. Of course, I don't give him serious works and outfits, but he helps to paint fabrics. The Great Silk Road. This was the name of the road on which in ancient times caravans transported valuable cargo from east to west. Among them was silk, which was produced in the east. It was considered a rare and very expensive fabric. Today, thanks to new technologies, there is no shortage in silk. But Azerbaijan, which is on the Silk Road route, has a special attitude to this fabric. The most popular place of silk production is the city of Sheki. Today we will tell you about how silk thread is made, from which fabric it is obtained. The source of silk is silkworms. They are bred in a variety of farms across Azerbaijan. Silky worms feed exclusively on the mulberry leaves. A special kind of silky worm is used to produce white silk. From the cocoon grains comes a caterpillar, which is feeding on leaves and grows quickly. It has four molting, after which its body takes a yellow color and silk glands are filled with protein fluid. After 30 days, caterpillar begins to weave a cocoon. In two weeks, a butterfly must come out of the cocoon, which from the inside releases liquid to help it get out. However, this should not happen in industry process. Therefore, after pupation, the cocoon is sent to production. Silk is produced on special machines in several stages. It starts with the fact that the cocoons brought from different farms Firstly, are dip in the water, then the thread is separated from the cocoon. One cocoon contains almost 1,000 meters of thread. The cocoons come to us in 20 kilogram bags. First, we put them in such vacuum containers to make them moistened and soft. From here, the cocoon gets into a so-called water bin. There, cocoons are transferred to oven capsules, where the water is heated to 80 degrees. The cocoons are put into hot water to wear out the worm inside the cocoon and soften the surface. After heating and soaking, the cocoons are placed on this machine. The entire process of stretching the thread takes place in water. It's not hot anymore. The spinning brushes pull out the thread. The workers carry out the selection process and spool the rougher fibers. They are not used to produce high-quality thread. Here the threads of the cocoon are in wound. We use exactly 11 cocoons. When the cocoons are good, the working process goes well. We can get good quality thread. The spool thread is removed two days later. The thread should not be very thin and not very rough. The number of cocoons used in thread stretching depends on silk density. Several fibers are joined into a single dense thread using the substance silk gum, which is contained in the cocoon itself. It is a gum-thickened protein layer. It's produced by a caterpillar during the construction of the cocoon. Spools with fibers are processed in another workshop. Here again, they get wet on machines. Then the fibers are put into a special tank of water for several hours. This is done to completely clean the sticky mass, so the thread will be very gentle. 
after that final drying and sorting is performed. This year, 60-150 tons of cocoons were produced, which will be enough for continuous production of thread for a year and a half. This year, the quality of the cocoon is high. From 3 kilograms of cocoon, we get 1 kilogram of silk yarn. Before, the same amount was produced from 4 kilograms. Therefore, the type of silkworm has a particular importance here. Here, after drying, the thread is sorted according to density. The most common are 215 and 310, which means the nominal number of twining. Kelagai are the clothes are produced of it. The main buyers are textile factories from other countries. Two to four tons of silk are produced per month. About 10 tons of cocoon are used. The silk thread is thinner than the human hair, but at the same time it's strong and water repellent. After all, it's originally designed to protect the cocoon from external influences. We have made sure that silk production is a labor-intensive process. And this is why this fabric, like in an ancient times, is considered one of the most expensive and attractive to buyers. In ancient times, people learned to use the long dry stick to lighten their shelters. Oil lamps were used in ancient Egypt, but the lamps that were hanged from the ceiling appeared in Byzantium. Greek masters paid special attention to the decoration of the interior, so copper, bronze and even silver were chosen to make lamps. At the end of 17th century, Muring glass lamps were highly valued in Europe. There is a theory how chandeliers appeared. One of them says that candles were displayed on the wheels of the cart. That's how the chandelier appeared. Kazakh ethnic designer Gizat Akpanbek makes chandeliers from wood, and they are very similar to Kazakh shanarak. Even from my youth, I thought how to make shanarak a wholesome element of the interior. I always liked it, and 10-15 years ago, I came up with an idea to make such a chandelier. I had to use a lot of materials. I was in search for suitable material all the time. I tried to make it from iron, wood, plastic and glass. And eventually I chose wood. Today we will visit Gazat's workshop. We will see the process of making chandeliers. We will learn how wood is processed, patterns are cut and how paint is applied. The first thing we need is plywood. We will cut the wheel out of it. Its size is 1 meter 7 centimeters. The width of the wheel is approximately 8 centimeters. We use a birch plywood because over time other species of tree can sweep out and change its shape. They can crack. That's why plywood is the best. It's also wood, but a thin one. Now it needs to be cut. We cut it with a router. We cut the bottom and the top of the wheel. 
Both hoops are ready. Exterior can be decorated with decorative patterns. Now we need to connect all the details. We do it with nails. We use wooden nails. I believe that there are a lot of things in our DNA from ancestors, such as love for handicraft. My grandmother used to make lamps from wicker. She was twisting the cotton, mocking it in the oil and setting it on fire. The lighting was enough for one to two hours. My great-grandparents were craftsmen. We still keep their works. For example, there is a PLA created by their hands. There is a chest for storing books. It has a complicated way of assembling. I still can't understand how it was made. I thought to take it to pieces to understand how it was made, but I can't dare to do it. This chest is more than 100 years old. And my grandfather was a shoemaker. He used to make shoes. But in addition, he skillfully decorated Piala by means of various metals. And I often sat and watched his work. I remember that in the process of making shoes, he used wooden nails made of birch. All the details we assembled together with wooden nails. Now we will drill the place for cross racks, then for the lamp holders. There will be eight of them. Install lamp holders and racks. Then we'll send it to paint. The most difficult thing is a wood painting. Some say, no, you do it wrong. First, it needs to be coated. And paint should be applied after the foundation color. Then it will lie down smooth. Okay, let it be smooth, but it'll look like plastic. Here, if paint is applied to the unpolished wood, then it will look better. The natural patterns of the tree will be clearly visible. Recently, two, three weeks ago, one man came and ordered a shanurak and asked to write a surah from the Quran at the bottom of shanurak. It's a great idea. We want to put it on notice. The special feature of Arabic letters is that if at least one point shifts, the word can change its meaning. We carefully glue them to each other. Now it's time to make crossbars of shanurak. We also cut them out of plywood, and the size depends on the size of the rim. Shanurak has two main elements, rim and rails. When you make a chandelier, there are several ways to bond the racks to the rim. One option is simply to connect them. The second one is glue it on top. The third is to cut and place it in a notch. It needs to be cut out first. Then, using the ripples, we connect them together and start collecting ready-made racks. In the same way, we will fix them to the rim. We remove the elements after we cut them out. The last stage is decoration. We decorate it with such beads and taijel bao. When you turn on the chandelier, the light is beautifully reflected in all this. A lot depends on the number of beads. Sometimes it feels like something is missing. You add a little detail and see, this is exactly what was necessary to do, or vice versa. If there are some extra details, you take one away and it looks perfect. That's all. The chandelier is ready. Master wishes light, happiness and wealth to everyone who owns a chandelier. <laughs>